Uh, so we've been in a series, if you haven't been coming for the last few weeks, we've been in a series called Direction. And the premise of the series is that God gives us direction for our lives. He gives us direction in every area of our lives. Uh, how, how many of you know uh, His direction is not always the direction that we want? Yeah. But that if, he get, if we take His direction, it'll lead us to a better destination uh, than the destination that we will encounter if we take our detour on our own. Uh, and, so, and so we're in this series called Direction, How to Get from Here to There. And we believe that, that uh, I believe that the scripture uh, provides us direction in every area of our life. And one of the things that we've been talking about as a church family is, what if we applied God's direction to our life in all of these different areas of our life, especially in the areas where it's more difficult to apply God's direction? So a couple of weeks ago, we talked about God's direction for our finances. We talked about God and money. Last week, we talked about more of an emotional state. What about when we're in a time of despondency or uh, when, I, when I feel discouraged? Uh, what, what is God's direction for me in times of anxiety or depression or fear? And, and so today, I want to I keep going in this theme of like going into the, the sensitive, the difficult topics. So I'm going to need you to pray for me today and have some grace for me today because I'm going to preach on the topic, how to keep your sanity while single. Come on, single people. Say, help him, Lord. Say, help him, Lord. Just give him grace today, Lord. Um, yes, give me grace today, Lord. Here's one thing I will say. I so deeply admire the single men and women in this congregation who are pursuing the Lord, who are serving, who are leading, who are leading life groups, leading teams. I mean, it is phenomenal uh, how many single people. And, and when I say single, I'm talking about Never married, uh, divorced, um, widowed. There are different categories of single people, but f for the moment, I'm talking to everybody that, that, are, that are walking this thing out uh, without, uh, without a, uh, a spousal or marital companion. Uh, I just honor you, and I praise you. I, I praise God for you. I don't praise you. I praise God for you. Um, I mean, I praise you with a lowercase p and you with a lowercase y. I praise what you're doing. You got me. All right, here we go. Um, uh, you, you hear a lot of things about uh, about uh, a lot of things about marriage and singleness. I was talking to a guy the other day, and I told him I was going to be preaching this series. And um, he says uh, he said to me, he goes, "Well, you know, Pastor," he says, uh, "single people are miserable, and uh, married people are miserable. So uh, I guess you just got to choose your poison." That's what he said. He said it just like that. So if that's your perspective today, I'm hoping to convert you to a slightly more sunny view of singleness and, and marriage. Uh, but I do know that it can be difficult <laughs> to be single. Um, it, it's a, it's a, it can be a challenging time. In fact, I read an article not long ago by a woman who was, uh, she was single and she was in a church. And a lot of people have, make, have expectations and assumptions about single people. And, um, you know, and, and this, this young woman was... was uh, she was just kind of tired of everybody assuming that she was desperate to get married because she was actually pretty content in her singleness. And, and, um, but she, every time she would show up at a wedding, she said that there would be this sort of group of women, uh, you know, married older women that would come over to her. And they were well-meaning. They were well-intended. But they would come over and they would they'd kind of lean into her, you know, kind of raise their eyebrows, have a little pity in their voice, and they'd say, you're next, you know. <laughs> and she said, okay, you know, she was frustrated by this. She was, She's kind of aggravated. She knew that they meant well, but it's still, it's kind of annoying. So she said that, um, you know, a, a while later, she, she was at a funeral. And um, she saw some of these ladies. And um, she didn't do it. But she was tempted to lean over there, raise those eyebrows, and say, you're next. But she didn't do it. She didn't do it. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ideas around singleness. It's a challenge. It, it can be a challenging time. In fact, I reached out this week to a whole a big group of single people in our church, and I emailed them. I said, you know, hey, I want I want you to share with me some of the challenges of being single and some of the joys of being single. I want to read you some of their responses because I got some amazing responses. I'm only reading just a small portion of them, but I got some really amazing and candid and authentic responses. Um, Here's, here are a few of them. 
Uh, one person said, not having a companion, as far as the challenge, not having a companion to share my thoughts, joys, and fears with. Another person said, feelings of rejection. Another person said, coming home to a cold house with no soul to share a hug, a moment, or a meal. Somebody else said, celibacy. Uh, somebody said, loneliness. Another person said, will I get married in time to have children? Another person said, I'm really struggling with the whole no sex before marriage thing. Somebody else said, I'm attracted to people of the same sex. How does that work as a single in the church? Somebody said, people, take, uh, people taking me for granted that I am available all the time just because I am single and I will be able to accept last minute requests. In other words, I got a life too. Um, uh, another person said, avoiding premarital sex is a challenge for me. Another person said, I wish married people would understand that we're not weird and we can actually be a good friend and we can handle life the same way that married people do. All right, married people, you got that? All right, good. Um, another person said, I wonder sometimes if I'm spiritually not, align uh, not living my best life like I would if I was aligned with the right partner or spouse for me. Another person said, comparison is definitely uh, one of the greatest challenges I face as a single person. When someone I know gets in a relationship uh, or gets engaged or married, it makes me even more aware of how single I am. And comparison leads right into struggling with identity, which is probably the worst part about being an unhealthy single. When you've been single for a long time, you haven't really been pursued by anyone. It's easy to think that there is something wrong with you. Uh, so they shared, I felt, some pretty intense and and candid uh, challenges. And then they also shared some joys like this. Um, only one schedule to follow. Uh, time for other things like volunteering, watching whatever I want on Netflix. Amen. Um, uh, I make my own decisions. I make my own schedule. I'm on my own timeline. Somebody said, you get to do whatever you want, whenever you want to do it, stay as late as you want, watch whatever you want, buy all the toys your heart desires without any concerns of what your partner might say. And another person said, I can experience life without a lot of restrictions. I can travel at a moment's notice, which I do. I can take chances on ideas and concepts I think will work without impacting someone dependent on me, especially financially. So there are a lot of challenges and there are a lot of joys. There's a, there's a lot going on uh, for people who are single, for people who are not married. Uh, and a lot of times we can pick up all kinds of perspectives and we get all kinds of voices about what it means to be single, uh, so, you know, how we should be when we're single. Um, but I want to just spend some time, if you'll allow me today, and married people, don't check out on me because there's some good stuff in here for the married folks too. Some that you need to know about singles and some of the principles and truths that apply to singles also apply to married people as well. Amen? So, so stick with me through this. Uh, and as I said, pray for God's grace uh, as, I, as, I, as I tackle this, this subject. Um, because it turns out that, that the Bible actually has something pretty radical to say about the state of singleness, uh, and especially radical, radical for today, but, in, but revolutionary in its time. In the, the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes this about singleness. He says, now to the unmarried and to the widows, I say it is good. Somebody say good. good. It is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. Now this was revolutionary at the time uh, that it was written because marriage was sort of like the end all be all. Marriage was like that, that final step. You know, if you look at, you know, if you look at most romantic comedies, you, know, you notice they end with the marriage. Like every Shakespeare comedy ends with the marriage. Like the, 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 the wedding, like it's the moment, right? Like that's the culmination of life's events. And you notice that they don't then go into the marriage and kind of work through that process, right? But they end with the wedding, like, boom, like maybe this is the ultimate act, right? But the Apostle Paul is saying, no, 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 no. For followers of Jesus, that's not the ultimate. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but he's saying, I'm, I'm saying, first of all, he's saying two things. One is that he's saying that he is single in this passage. That's pretty amazing. Like the most prolific evangelist in the Christian faith one of the most powerful apostles, uh, one of the most devout followers of Jesus, one of the most useful visionary Christians on the planet was a single person. And a lot of people, uh, scholars debate, was he married or was he, you know, was he a widow? Had he never been married? Was he divorced? What, you know, and there, was, there, there are questions around that. We don't know from the, 
from the passage, but we do know that, first of all, he's saying, hey, man, I'm single, right, in this passage. And the other thing he's saying, and the point I want you to get today, is that singleness is good. He's saying it's a good thing. Man, I got no amens. All the single people are just like, I want to see where this goes before I start amen in the preacher. Uh, he says singleness is a good state. It's not a, it's not a bad state. It's not like your life is directed towards getting married, right? It's not like your life it will, will be fulfilled in marriage. Like you, you know, you don't fulfill your purpose in life by getting married. That's, he's saying singleness as a state is a good state. Now, just because it's good doesn't mean that it's not hard sometimes, right? I mean, just not everything good is easy. Sometimes it's hard uh, to be single. But he's saying it is, it is good. Now, I have, uh, and you probably picked up the tone in some of those emails. You hear sometimes, and I've heard as a pastor, people saying, like, you know, when you're single for a long enough time, you start to ask the question, what's wrong with me? And implied in that question is that there's something wrong or there's something bad about being single. There's something inherently bad about being single. And I don't think we just pick that up out of the ether. I think that's, there's a cultural sort of norm that we, that we hear. You know, we, get, we pick up different directions and different signals from different people, right? But the scripture teaches us, no. The, the scripture says, there's nothing wrong with you. Can I, just, can I just put you at rest on that? If you're single... It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you, all right? doesn't mean that, all right? You're good, right? Maybe let me clarify. There's nothing more wrong with you than all the married people that you see around you. There's a few things wrong with all of us, all right? But there's nothing especially, particularly wrong with you. Uh, where do we pick up this idea that, that marriage is like the, the, the ideal form of, of living? Um, Tim Keller writes this, and I, I, he describes what he calls the theology of singleness. And it's kind of a long quote, but I think it's, it's good. And plus, I'm gonna, he says it really well, so if I blow it for the rest of the sermon, you'll at least have this quote. All right, Western civilization, he says, idolizes individualism and self-realization and views marriage as something to attain after reaching a certain point in life. Marriage, therefore, becomes a means of self-fulfillment and an idol. And it says this, Eastern civilization idolizes the family and makes everything revolve around it. Family becomes an idol. People start to believe that like your ultimate fulfillment will be in your marriage and, and, and your family. He says Christianity though has a unique view of singleness because there is no obligation to get married. This was radical in the first century. The idea that you didn't have to get married in order to fulfill your purpose in life. A marriage is understood as a temporary earthly institution until the second coming with the new heaven and the new earth. Now this is sort of an interesting point. We, as followers of Jesus, Jesus said that there isn't marriage, you know, in, in the afterworld, in eternal life, in heaven. There's not marriage. So marriage is a, is a, is a temporary state. Uh, and for some of you that are in bad marriages, you're, that's your gift. There you go. It's, it'll, 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 be, it'll be over in heaven. For those of you uh, that are in good marriages, try and encourage everybody this morning. Just want everybody to be encouraged. Uh, for those of you that are in good marriages, it feels a little sad. Okay. Um, for singles who choose to get married, marriage is a sacrament that is meant to be an act of service. That's what marriage is. So it's an act of service, right? So as you're thinking about marriage, you know, think about like it's an act of, it's an act of service. Christianity drastically changes both how marriage and singleness should be viewed by its followers. And then it says this. It also emphasizes that marriage will never give you everything that you are looking for. It's not going to be the end-all, be-all fulfillment of every desire, hope, and dream that you have. It's, it can be really good, okay? But if you're looking for it to be God in your life, you're looking in the wrong place. Everything that you're looking for, that can only be found in Christ. This view is different from the world's view. Christians are called to be set apart from the world while remaining in it. So basically, if I, if I can summarize where we're at so far, the Apostle Paul says, I'm single, and singleness as a state is good, right? Singleness is good. You're okay. It's all good. Now, the question that you may be asking is, 
what's so good about it, right? So some of you that are single that don't want to be single might be saying, well, why is it so good? How is it so good? And, and the Apostle Paul tells us it's good because it gives us an opportunity. Here you go. Next slide. To use your personal freedom to narrow your spiritual focus. That's one of the benefits of being single is that it actually provides you an opportunity to not be hearing and not be trying to, um, you know, serve a bunch of different people in your life, a spouse and children and all that. It gives you an opportunity to use your freedom to focus on the most important thing in your life. How, how many of you ever go to Aldi's? Anybody go to Aldi's? All right. Um, my wife is obsessed with Aldi's. She loves Aldi's. Loves it. And there are other grocery stores, Deerbergs and Schnooks, and I'm sure they're great too. And this isn't an advertisement for Aldi's, by the way. This is just, I'm just observation. She loves Aldi's. And when I asked her, I said, what do you love so much about Aldi's? You know what she said? Lack of choice. Yes. Yes. Like, you know, if you go to Schnooks and you go by, try to strawberry jam, there's like 40 varieties. Smothers, Schmucks. The, the Knott's Berry Farm. I don't shop for jelly a lot, but, but I, I know that there are a lot, of, a lot of options. If you go to all these, there's just one option. You want strawberry jam? Here's your strawberry jam. Strawberry jam aisle. It's very small. It's just a jar of strawberry jam. But, but there's something freeing about having undivided attention. There's something freeing about being able to focus with laser focus on one thing. There's something liberating about not being distracted by all the cares of the world and being able to focus on one thing. And so the Apostle Paul is saying, look, actually, your singleness is an opportunity for you to pursue the most important thing on the planet, in the world, in your life. And that is your pursuit of God. Here's how he puts it in that same letter. He says, I, I want you to be free from concern. Next slide. He says, an unmarried man, single man, is concerned about the Lord's affairs how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. He's at Deerberg's. He's got all these things to figure out, right? An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit, but a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband, right? And he says this, I am saying this for your good. I'm, I'm letting you know, like, this is good for you. This is, I want you, to, I, want you to, I want you to take this with you because it's something good for you. It's good for you to be able to have undivided devotion, right? I'm not saying it as a restriction, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. It's an invitation while you are single to just devote yourself to to a deeper growth in your faith, a deeper recognition of who you really are, a deeper recognition of his love for you. Uh, and, and it's an opportunity for you to do that. In fact, for me, some of, my, some of my greatest spiritual strides, I became a Christian when I was single. And that was the greatest moment in my life. I became a follower of Jesus while I was single. It was an opportunity for me to begin focusing on what was important. I got an email this week from uh, a single person in our church, and I love this because this is, what, this is what they said about on this topic. What I have found is that my time as a single person has been such an amazing blessing. It allows me uh, time and energy to form a really close relationship with God. I wish I would have been aware of this blessing much earlier in my life. It would have saved me from some unhealthy relationships, right? Because I would have been focused. I would have been devoted. I would have known that I got to experience something richer and deeper and more beautiful than an earthly, earthly relationship. It's a relationship with my maker. My bond with God and my faith while waiting are so strong, and it is due to the lessons he has taught me by trusting in him while single. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful uh, notion. It's a beautiful idea that we can actually spend time. We can focus our attention, focus our energy on one thing. I love this quote. I'm going to give you another quote by Paul Tillich. He says, our language, this is a, uh, Paul Tillich is, a, is a, a 20th century theologian, very influential. Our language has wisely sensed the two sides of being alone. It has created the word loneliness to express the pain of being alone, and it has created the word solitude to express the glory of being alone. So there's some challenges. There are some hard things about being alone, 
But there's also an opportunity there. I want to just encourage you, there's an opportunity there to really pursue what is absolutely essential, what is absolutely important, what is absolutely vital. Our job, my job uh, as a pastor is to help create environments where you can do that. Small groups and our dream team and serving and next steps and all these different areas is to, is to provide opportunities for you to really develop your faith. And actually, when you do, it actually makes you a stronger person, both individually, and if you ever do get married, it will, it will actually strengthen you and prepare you for that, that time, right? So he says, look, I'm going to sum up again. He says, look, next, next uh, verse, he says, if they cannot uh, control themselves. So here, here's, right before this, he says, it is good, right? It, it, singleness is good. But if a single person cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. And the Apostle Paul was not prude, okay? He gets it. He understands. My children were in the first service, so I was so constrained by what I could say. Um, but maybe I'll keep some of those constraints just for, you know. Um, the Apostle Paul is basically saying, look, I know that not everybody can do this, right? I know that not everybody is, 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 is capable of walking out this life of, of, of celibacy, like he, you know, he had the gift of celibacy. I don't think that's a, a ubiquitous gift. I don't think, you know, 99% of us have it. I think maybe 0.017% of us. I don't know. I've never done the stats. But I just know that most of the people I know don't have that gift. And so he says, if you don't have that gift, if you're not capable of, of living out this life in, in, in celibacy, and abs- it's better to get married. It's better to get married. Now, some of you that are single are going, yeah, I'm already there. Like... Like, I got that. Like, I know that it would be better for me to get mar- married. How do I get married? Like, I'm trying to get married, right? Now, this is, a hard, this is one of the hard things about, about the Scripture. The Scripture does not actually tell us specifically what method or what means or what process we should use to get married, okay? Because in the first century, when it was written, people reached puberty at about the age of 14 or 15, and about the age 15 or 16, their parents said, hey, you know, let's put those two together and they're going to be married and that's the deal. It was all arranged and there was a very short time of singleness, uh, if any, for a lot of people in the first century. Well, now, you know, the average age of puberty is 11 or 12 and people don't get married. I mean, the average age of marriage is around 30 in the United States. So there's this long period and, and it's caused a lot of confusion. How do I navigate this? The Bible doesn't tell you specifically how to navigate it. It doesn't give you the process, which on one hand is liberating because there will be, I don't know, you know, there are different theories and some people say, oh, you should never date. You should only, um, what's the court or you should only not, you should date or I don't know. There are a lot of different methods and ideas and thoughts around that. The Bible is not clear on that. So there's, there's freedom in how you do it. There's freedom in the process, but there are some principles that apply no matter what. All right? And one of the principles as you're seeking to find a spouse is this. Uh, don't seek completion. Seek companionship. Seek companionship, not completion. What does that mean? That means as you're approaching the dating process or whatever process you're going to use, don't seek someone to complete you. You're already complete. Somebody just needs to know that right now. You're good. You're already complete. Whole and complete. Uh, uh, In Genesis it says, you were made in the image of God. Male and female, you were made in the image of God. You're already complete. Jerry Maguire got this one wrong. Sorry, Jerry. But look, when when my wife and I got married, it turns out that I didn't complete her. She was already complete. She was totally complete already. I came along and, and it turns out I was complete. And we came into each other's lives and we got married to each other. But not in order so that she would fulfill this gaping half missing part of me, right? Here's the thing. Some, and you you may have heard all different phrases around this kind of thing, but you may have heard people say, um, don't look for the one, be the one. And I get that. There's a, there's a part of that that I get. Like, in other words, pursue God while you're single, right? But the truth of the matter is you're actually not the one, right? And you never will be the one. The scripture says nothing about the one except the one. All right. It it, it turns out that you're not the one. He's not the one. She's not the one. But you already have access to the one who makes you complete. So go for him. Go for that. And then that gives you a wholeness and an integrity when you come into a relationship 
with somebody else. Are you tracking with me this morning? You're already complete in him. You are already whole. Uh, there's a, an author uh, named Ben Stewart, and he writes a lot about singleness. And one of the things that he says is that a lot of times singles, uh, single people are actually, you know, looking for that completeness. They're looking for that person to fill uh, that void. And here's how he describes the way some people look at it. He says, uh, here's imagining what they would say. I want someone who will fill every vacancy in me, awaken dormant gifts inside me, and continuously enrapture me in otherworldly emotional bliss. All the married people are like, say what now? <laughs> then he says, this puts tremendous pressure on another human being, right? Don't look for someone to complete you. In fact, I like, I like how it's described in the, in the book of Genesis when God makes uh, uh, a spouse for Adam. He says this, he says, the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a, a, a helper that's suitable for him. Suitable means good match. Doesn't mean perfect. In fact, I don't, I don't know if you read the end of that story. It wasn't, it wasn't the ideal situation. All right, pretty early on. There were some speed bumps in that marriage, if you don't mind my saying. Right? So, so God's not saying, hey, you got to be perfect. And you got to find the perfect one. It's good to have some, some standards, all right? It's good to have some ideas about what you want. It's good to lay out some principles and some truths. And someday we'll get all into that. Like, but for instance, is he faithful? Is she kind? Is he patient? Is she truthful, right? There's some good, there's some good categories, but you're not going to find the perfect spouse because they don't exist. And you're not the perfect spouse. Stop trying to find something that you've already got. He's already there for you. He's already got you. He's already with you, right? In fact, I'm going to end with this. Being single doesn't mean being alone. Being single does not mean that you are alone. I will tell you this. The most profound moment in my life, the most profound moment in my life, happened when I was a single person and I discovered in that moment that I was not alone. And it was long before I got married, but it was a moment when God intervened in my life and I recognized for the very first time that not only was I not alone in that moment, but that I had never been alone. That he had been in pursuit of me from the day I was born. When I thought I was in trouble, he was with me. When I thought I was alone, he was with me. When I was afraid, he was with me. When I was lonely, he was with me. And when I discovered that, that is actually what gave me the strength and the ability and the power to move forward in a way that was going to ultimately be healthy emotionally and spiritually healthy for me. Now, this isn't just for single people. There are married people that feel alone, right? You are not alone. This is the beautiful thing about following Jesus. This is the beautiful thing about his direction is that, as I said earlier, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. You can't separate yourself from the love of Christ. Your past does not separate you from the love of Christ. When I talk about singleness, people start to feel some regret sometimes about some decisions that they may have made, right? That doesn't separate you. Those decisions that you made, those mistakes, they don't separate you from the love of Christ. Some people start to get anxious and worry about the future. Your future and your anxiety and your worry doesn't separate you from the love of Christ. Neither death, nor life, nor heights, nor depths. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So I just want to encourage everybody here today with that truth. I want you to carry that in your singleness and in your marriage. You are not alone. I want, to, I want to have us close today by doing something that we don't often do. I'd love for you to stand with me, if you will. There's a particular psalm that I've been teaching my children. Many of you know it. It's a very famous psalm. But it captures, I believe, the essence. The essence of what God is trying to teach us about who we are. There's a great moment 
in the, in the life of Jesus where he's teaching his disciples. And his, his mom and his sisters and his brothers come and they want to talk to him. And they send a message to him. They say, hey, tell Jesus that his mom and sisters and brothers are here. Jesus says something revolutionary and radical. He says, who are my brothers and my sister and my mother? And then he points around to his disciples and he goes, these are my brothers and my sisters and my mother because we all belong to the same father. They're doing the will of my father. Now what he wasn't doing is he wasn't dissing his biological family. He was extending, he was expanding the view of family. He was saying you are family because we're all family because we have the same father. So you're not alone. You are among, you are among your family and you are with your father. In fact, when we were trying to find, a, uh, years ago, when we were trying to find um, uh, a mission statement for One Family Church, we had this big brainstorm with all of our leaders. And somebody came up with a really great, a really great slogan. And, it, and, it, and they said this, when you're here, you're family. I said, man, that is a great, that is a great motto. And then somebody goes, that's Olive Garden. Yeah. That's their motto. So I said, man. <laughs> If they ever go out of business, we're taking that motto, okay? But that's what God is saying to us today. He's saying, look, you're not alone. I'm with you. Your, your brothers and sisters are with you. We're here together. We are one. So what I want to do is I want us to, to end this service today by affirming God's presence in our life. I want us to all say and read out loud Psalm 23. I'll get us started, but I want all of us to read it out loud together and read it as an affirmation of God's presence in your life. Here's what it says. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Let's bow our heads. Father, we are so grateful that we're not alone. We are so grateful that you are here right now. We're so grateful that you're in our hearts. I pray for every single person in this house, every divorced person, every widowed person, that they would experience your love and your grace and your mercy in such a powerful way. They would experience it, God, in, in the wholeness of who you are. And they would begin to long for you and seek you. God, I pray you would drive away the loneliness with your ever-present love and your grace and your mercy. And God, I pray that we would pursue you. And in pursuing you, we would bring glory, praise, and honor to you. We pray this in the holy name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday.